Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you who are joining us on the East Coast. My name is Marco Pasqua, and I'm going to be your moderator and host for the next hour. I'm actually in a blue shirt, and I have a red wall behind me with a bunch of Back to the Future memorabilia on shelves. I also happen to have cerebral palsy, and I'm a manual wheelchair user. Welcome to the Power of Inclusive Language panel. I would first like to begin by acknowledging that the land in which I'm speaking is the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen, Katsi, Semiamu, and Tawasin's First Nations. Now, as we're gathered here today from across the country, I'd like to ask that we take a moment to express gratitude for being able to call these lands our home. Now, today is the annual United Nations International Day of Persons with Disabilities, a day to promote understanding of disability issues and mobilize supports for the dignity, rights, and well-being of persons with disabilities. Today is also an opportunity for us to increase awareness of how our world can benefit from the equitable inclusion of persons with disabilities in every single aspect of life, which I know is super, super important to me. Now, this year's theme of the International Day of Persons with Disabilities is leadership and participation of persons with disabilities towards an inclusive, accessible, and sustainable post-COVID world. And I know we're all waiting for that. And that is why today we're bringing together leaders, advocates, allies, and uh, different individuals in the disability community to speak about the power of language and how words actually matter. Now, I wanna be clear, our aim is not to create an army of language police. In fact, our hope for this session is that everyone will learn a few new words to add to their vocabulary and obviously have a heightened uh, sense of how personal and powerful that language that we use actually is. So I personally would like to thank the Rick Hansen Foundation for hosting this event today. And of course, Mr. Brad McCandle, the VP of Access Inclusion at the Foundation, who was unable to make it with us here today, but I'm honored to be speaking on his behalf. Thanks, Brad. I really appreciate that. This event means so much to me because we're literally giving a voice to people who directly live and work within the disability community. And I think that we have to have more forums like this. We have an incredible group of people here today. So on behalf of the Rick Hansen Foundation, I want to express my sincere gratitude to our panelists, Christine Selinger, Megan Kelly, Monica Ackerman, and Wassam Constantine. Now, before the panelists introduce themselves, I would like to let you know about a few logistics of the event itself. So all attendees have been muted by the host. Now to turn on captions, please use the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom bar. And you can also use the subtitle settings to increase the size of the subtitles that you're viewing, or you can view them in a separate window by clicking on the link in the chat window that we have. We also have ASL interpretation, and the chat function has been disabled so that we don't distract the panelists. But that's totally fine because I will facilitate a 15 minute Q&A session at the end of the session, but feel free to submit your questions as we're going throughout uh, using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Okay, questions will be posed to the panelists at the end, as I mentioned, and any that we don't get to will be answered and sent via email by the Rick Hansen Foundation following today's session. And lastly, maybe most importantly, this event is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to all registrants by email by next week. Now, a couple of notes for the panelists themselves. Okay, we do have a live captioner with us here today. So I ask that we all do our best to speak clearly as possible as it helps the captioner as well as the ASL interpreter. And as a fast talking Italian, I can tell you that is difficult for me. Okay, but I will work on that. In addition, please use the raise hand feature function when wanting to add into the conversation. So the next hour is gonna be action packed. So without further ado, I am pleased to hand it over to Wassam to commence with the introductions. Take it away, Wassam. Hello, bonjour. Uh, my name is Wissam Constantin, and I am the president of Canadian Association for the Deaf, Association de Sourds de Canada. And I'm really honored to be included on this panel today. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm hoping that the audience members will all enjoy watching this. Um, as a visual description, I'm a man and a person of color. Um, I'm wearing a light blue J 
jacket and I'm sitting in my office and I have to say there is quite a bit of paperwork <laughs> piled up here. So excuse me, I do have some catching up to do in that regard. Hi, and I'm Monica Ackerman. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Director of Enterprise Accessibility at Scotiabank. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm a white woman of European descent with way more silver hair than black, and I'm joining you from my home in Toronto, and behind me I have a lovely painting that my husband made. Hi, my name is Megan Kelly, and I'm the National Manager of Business Development with the Canadian Council on Rehabilitation and Work, CCRW. Uh, I am a white woman. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am wearing a black cardigan uh, with a collared black and white pinstripe shirt and round wireframe glasses. I have shoulder length light brown hair. Although last night somebody told me it was strawberry blonde, so I stand to be corrected. Uh, my background uh, is a gray wall uh, with some artwork. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to participate today. And I think Christine, you're next. I am, thank you, Megan. Um, I'm Christine Salinger. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a Caucasian woman with strawberry blonde hair, um, tied up in a bun. I'm wearing glasses and sitting in front of a bunch of plants. You may occasionally also see a big yellow dog wandering around behind me, and that's just because I'm working from home. Um, I am an instructional designer with Canadian Blood Services, as well as the Director of Education and Events for the Abilities Expo here in Canada. Um, I'm also a consultant working on disability awareness training um, and advocacy within our community. I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you to the Rick Hansen Foundation for hosting this. Thank you so much, panelists. I really appreciate that. And we do have an action-packed show, as I said. So let's just dive right into the first question. So uh, Alana, IT, if you want to pop up that first slate, if we have one, each panelist is going to have 90 seconds to answer this first uh, question. Okay, and we're going to start in the same order in which we did the introductions. So with Sam, I'd like you to answer this question first. What does disability inclusive language mean to you? Um, in terms of disability inclusive language, um, maybe my answer will not be quite what you are expecting to hear. But um, because generally when people... Um, in most of society think about disability inclusive language, they're thinking about particular words that they're hearing or seeing or reading. But the word language itself actually has a lot of diversity that can um, be included in it. It might include gestural language, might include drawing, and it might include sign languages. So I would really like to spotlight sign languages in my answer today because there are so many misunderstandings that people have about what sign languages are. Um, many people believe that sign language is universal and that there's one sign language used all over the world, but there are so many. Just as there are over 300 different languages that are spoken, there are also over 300 different languages signed around the world. Generally, um, each country or region might have their own uh, particular sign language with its own structure and grammar that is used by deaf people in that region. Um, so I would just like to really highlight that sign languages are um, important and that they belong to the deaf communities that use them um, and that each deaf community will have their own culture as well. So that is my answer with that question. Great. Well, Sam, thank you so much. And that's an eye opener, I think, for a lot of people. They often forget that sign language has so much diversity behind it as well. Um, Mon uh, Monica, over to you. So for me, disability inclusive language really is about putting the person first, being human centered and acknowledging that disability really is an individual lived experience and, a, and, a, and an integral part of a person's with the, uh, identity that it's but disability is not the only thing that defines us and defines them. And inclusive language really goes beyond just the word or the phrase used to describe a disability or a person with a disability. To me, it extends to the stories that we tell and the narratives we create. Does the language perpetuate bias and stereotypes? 
or does it foster understanding and connection? Do the stories that you tell or share on social media depict people with disabilities as heroes to be admired or victims who need help and pity? Or do they celebrate both the uniqueness and the everydayness of the human experience? These to me are some inclusion decisions that we are empowered to make each and every day. Yeah, I like that, Monica. I also love that you kind of mentioned about like not necessarily placating people with particular stories, right? Does that highlight them in the best of light? So to remember that, even though you may be inspired by a certain thing, uh, is what you're saying is inspirational, um, could potentially be perceived as offensive. So it's important to think about that with language. Um, Megan, over to you. Thanks, Marco. Uh, disability inclusive language, uh, you know, means to me a lot of things, but I think the recognition uh, that we need to have or that I have is that language evolves over time uh, and that the context and understanding that we have today, uh, we need to allow for that to change as we as we learn, as we grow, uh, and as we, you know, respect, you know, the others around us and, and the choice in terms of the language they choose uh, in terms of identity. Um, you know, you, I think starting from a place of best practice in the recognition of language that's used within legislation or through the UN and the Convention of Rights of persons with disabilities is where we start, uh, but that that is not the place that we stay. Uh, when we interact with individuals with lived experience uh, and that we're respectful of their choice uh, in terms of language and identity um, and that that choice of language is what is the most inclusive piece, I think, to pay attention to. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Megan. In fact, you know, I know that the Rick Hansen Foundation is a huge proponent of person first language, but sometimes people uh, prefer identity first, right? So it's important to ask the person and respect uh, their choices. And last but not least for this first question, Christine, take it away. Thanks, Marco. Um, and thanks for that note there. Um, I didn't include it as part of my introduction, but I identify as a disabled person, specifically putting disabled first. I'm a wheelchair user. Um, but in terms of inclusive language, to me, inclusive language across the board is both thoughtful and deliberate. Um, and I say that on purpose because I know that language is difficult to change. Um, you know, you, you'll you say things, things will come out your mouth before you've realized what you've said often. Um, I'm definitely guilty of that. Um, and so we're not here today to tell you that what you're doing is wrong or that you're a bad person if you use certain language, not at all. We're here to like, provide awareness of the impacts of language, to talk about what language means to us, um, and to give you some insight into how you can change it. Um, so it's thoughtful in that thinking about what you're saying before you say it, and thinking about the impacts of the community before you say it, and deliberate in that if you catch yourself about to say something that could be considered ableist, that you consider a different way to phrase it, um, or consider what you're saying instead. Um, so thoughtful and deliberate. I fully agree with you. I think it comes down to intentionality. If someone is not intending to be malicious, then that I think it needs to be taken into account. Okay, moving on to our next question. What are some inclu uh, inclusive communication considerations from a pan disability lens? And for this one, I'm actually gonna start with the person we just heard from, uh, Christine. So Christine, do you have some thoughts on this? I do, thanks. Um, now, I know this question sounds like a mouthful um, or a lot to kind of wrap your mind around, um, but it's a lot coming back to what Wassam said at the beginning. It's considering disability for all that it is. Um, often when we think disability or we try to picture disability, we have a picture of a person in a wheelchair. And I think that comes down to our parking spaces being labeled that way to a lot of legislation using that imagery. Um, and unfortunately, Fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know. I love my wheelchair, but we make up a very small portion of people with disabilities. And so when we're thinking about language, when we're thinking about disability, we need to think beyond mobility aids and beyond mm. people who use wheelchairs. Um, so that includes, as Wassam said, um, people who speak in sign language. Um, that includes people with mental health diagnoses and includes you know, any number of disabilities in there. Um, it's often forgotten that 
the most used um, accessibility aid in the world are glasses, which I also uh. happen to wear. So when we consider disability as this enormous umbrella term, um, we need to consider it beyond just maybe what first comes to mind for you um, and consider the whole population. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I often think about what Brad McCannell says, the VP of Access Inclusion at Rick Hansen. He'll say that Rick did too good of a job on his Man in Motion tour because that's what people associate is that wheelchair. But there are so many other things, especially as us as RHFAC professionals, that when we're assessing an environment, we have to consider it from all lenses, even those that extend beyond our particular disability or abilities, right? So, so, so important to consider that. Um, Megan, how about you? Do you have, you have thoughts on this? Oh, go ahead, Christine. Did you have something Sorry, else to add? One more thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, just to include that uh, disabilities aren't segmented. Um, and I meant emotion to my glasses, as I said that, but um, people can have more than one. So when thinking about one disability, you can't just also exclude others. So just remembering that there's a whole population of us with all sorts of stuff going on and everything is unique. That's a that's a great reminder. That's an absolutely great reminder. Um, Megan, I believe you have some thoughts on this as well. And, and maybe because I, I know that you're a service provider too. So potentially your answer might have something to do with service providing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we look at communication from a, a pan disability or cross disability lens, it's important to recognize that, um, you know, communication over the last 18 months has significantly changed, uh, I would say, from a service provider perspective, uh, from a business perspective, in how we engage and, and speak and meet with people. Uh, so taking a cross disability lens to to that perspective and recognizing that um, you know, inclusive communications, specifically in the digital world, uh, means you know, starting from a place of you know, maybe you're not sure of what you know, accessibility and inclusive communication means in Zoom or in Teams, or you know, how do I facilitate a, um, you know, a meeting with an individual, uh, a job seeker who doesn't have access to digital communication? How do we uh, ensure that there's inclusive communication opportunities uh, for individuals who are impacted by access to those? And I think that that you know, a lot of organizations over the last 18 months have, have taken a really significant journey, a learning journey into what that means and have prioritized uh, you know, the digital communication and the inclusivity of that in how we interact with our colleagues, uh, you know, persons with disabilities who we're uh, advocating for or supporting or working with to ensure that we're starting from a place of yes, uh, that we're going to ensure that we're providing accessible and inclusive communication opportunities, uh, but that we're learning as well. Um, so I think that, you know, when we talk about communication from across disability lens from both a service provider perspective and a business perspective, uh, we need to recognize that digital, that digital piece and, you know, we may assume uh, that it's easily accessible uh, right off the hop because it's IT. Uh, but it's not. So it's important to pay attention to those considerations. Oh, wow. That is so huge, actually. And so service providers, we're calling to you, make sure that you are considering alternative formats for the materials that you provide. You may be unintentionally screening out potential candidates that could come work for your organization simply because your documentation wasn't inclusive or potentially even somebody couldn't use it for, with a screen reader or other technology that you might not interface with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a, that's a really powerful statement as well, especially for service providers. And Wassam, I think that you have uh, some thoughts to close out this question. So I'll, I'll pass it to you. Well, I think I agree with what everyone has said so far. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree that, yeah, um, the, the, the term disability has got to include more than just one group of people. So. Um, there's disabilities that are visual that you can see, uh, there's disabilities that you can't see. So there's a whole gambit, a whole range that we run there. And like uh, what <coughs> Christine said, she loves her, her wheelchair and I love being deaf. It's a peaceful world. And um, there's loads of things in this 
world that are are worth hearing and not hearing. So uh, for me, I love it. And I think it's important that we remember this world, uh, this, it continues to change. So uh, lots of words, lots of communication, ways of communicating um, have been, and you know, in the 1900s have been appropriate, but were no longer appropriate in the 50s. And then what was inappropriate in the 1900s, um, you know, and then they swapped, they swapped, you know, vice versa, it became appropriate again in the 50s. So we have to remember that this is always changing and we have to keep our minds open. We have to continue to learn. We have to continue to engage with each other. Uh, so what's acceptable now today may not be acceptable again in a year and so and and vice versa so we have to just continue to keep uh, an open mind and 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 don't think that it's it's ever going to be finished that oh finally we're there um it's something it's continued and it's something we have to continue to work to accommodate and so i want to emphasize that you know i'll ask Like I'll use my disability, for example. Um, within that, there's um, a whole bunch of variety. There's people who, who prefer lip reading, who prefer signing, who prefer reading and writing, who prefer to use an interpreter. So it's not just one experience. I mean, uh, you, you have uh, one experience with one disabled person. It doesn't necessarily mean that all dis disabled people are going to be that like that person you have to ask you have to and it's not up to them to make that accommodation you have to ask and you have to make the, the effort to accommodate thank you yeah i think that it, people do have to take responsibility for that and as you say um you know this is ever evolving this is something that we have to recognize is going to change from year to year and from person to person uh i know that i'm not one of the panelists but as a person with a disability i can say i don't like terms uh differently able or diverse ability personally, because I'm proud to be a person with a disability. I'm proud to be part of the disability community. It is a community for me. Uh, but that is not necessarily that every single uh, person that's out there, you know, likes those terms. So we can't make that assumption, right? So, um, but I think it's a really good reminder to stay focused on that and to know that you can just ask if you're unsure or uncertain of things. Most people won't take offense by you asking the question. Okay, we're moving on to question number three. Is there a time uh, you experienced inclusive language, speaking of inclusive language, uh, and what impact did it have on you? And I think I'm gonna start on this one with uh, Monica. So Monica, do you have some thoughts on this? Uh, have you heard of inclusive language being used? And, and yeah, so this one actually caught me by surprise as I was uh, getting ready for the presentation. Um, uh, it was harder to answer than I thought. The more I thought about it, the more uncomfortable I became. And, and that's because as a, a white Western woman who currently doesn't identify as having a disability, I recognize the privilege that I have. And I thought, is my voice really the one that's supposed to be heard here? You know, is it appropriate for me to be really telling my story? And so like in the discomfort, I was thinking, okay, what's my perspective? What's my role? And, and I came to the place where it really is as an ally and an advocate and an influencer. And at Scotiabank, I work, uh, my team and I, we work uh, to advocate for the need for accessible and inclusive practices uh, so that our customers and our employees with disabilities are treated with the dignity and, and the respect that they deserve. And a big part of the job is to foster a culture of inclusion. And so I came at it from that, that perspective. And uh, real and really, it's the, the experiences that really make me do a happy dance are when I hear others make disability inclusive language part of their vocabulary and their work. And I start to see the culture change happen. And so, you know, it's a couple of examples. So when uh, a colleague reached out after a diversity and equity presentation that generally doesn't include disability, spoke about disability from uh, an intersectional lens. And they said, you know, I feel safer um, and I'm more able to claim my identity at work. Or when a design team 
used an example of feedback from a customer with vision loss to showcase the work that they've done with us, what they did around improving font size and color when they were building the app. Or even yesterday at our International Day of Persons with Disabilities event, our executive champion spoke about um, uh, accessibility as a human right, powerful words, and how we view disability through a social model lens and are working to um, build products and services that are accessible by design. So all that language is about empowering and inclusion. And so it's all those moments like that, that I can truly see like the positive, positive impact of uh, disability inclusive language. You know, thank you for being vulnerable and honest about your role and how you thought that you ne didn't necessarily have a place to answer the question, but I feel that every single person has a place to answer these questions from their own perspective. And that's really, really important. Uh, Christine, I know that in the work that you do uh, sometimes uh, and in your personal life, you may have impacted this as well, especially as a wheelchair user. So I'm so curious on uh, when inclusive language has been used for you and the impact that it has. Thanks, Marco. Um, I have two really everyday examples and I'm going to use them because they're everyday examples um, and they had tremendous impact on me, but in a way that I didn't notice I was missing from a conversation until it happened. Mm -hmm. um, so the first was, um, as anybody with a mobility challenge um, would know, trying to go out for dinner or trying to go out in public at all, you have to ask a lot of questions about access. And when my husband and I had first moved to Toronto, uh, we live in Calgary now, um, but when we first moved to Toronto, we were trying to find out what in our community was accessible. And usually you make the phone call and say, hi, are you wheelchair accessible? And you get in like, oh, um, uh, e, uh, mm, uh, let me ask somebody. Um, and, uh, and it's just sort of normal, you're used to it. Then you follow up with specifics on the bathroom and things like that. And we had called one pub um, and they just like, hello, are you wheelchair accessible? Yep. And then they just listed off how they were accessible. No step at the door, buttons, the door wow. opens out, the door on the stall opens out. And I, I was totally unprepared for somebody else to be prepared for the question. Um, so for anybody out there who runs a business, be prepared for the question and have answers. Because it was so wonderful to recognize that this place had, had knew the the things that were needed to be accessible. Um, the second is, now unfortunately, the first time um, I experienced this was at the funeral of a friend. Um, but as you know, with funerals, weddings, um, in a lot of places where people are asked to stand, often with uh, the national anthem, things like that. It was the first time I experienced uh, somebody saying, please stand if you are able. And that those if you are able at the very end mm -hmm. was so tremendously impactful because it included me. I've always felt so awkward when everyone's asked to stand and I have to sit. Um, and so it was just the first time that I was really included in that conversation and I didn't have to feel strange about being the person sitting. Um, so there's lots of little ways to include disability in your everyday language and in, and in your practices. Um, and so just keep those little things in mind. Yeah, no, fantastic. And in fact, uh, I'm the type of guy that uses humor in awkward situations. So when people would say, please stand, you know, as a kid, I would just raise both my arms up and wave them around and, you know, make sure that people knew that I wasn't being rude by not standing if they thought I was in a stadium seat or something like that. And your point around, um, you know, restaurants and things, my wife and I are an inter interable couple. And so she always calls ahead and asks uh, for certain restaurants if it's going to be, you know, accessible. And they'll say, absolutely, it is. And they they meant it on the main floor once you get up the 10 stairs that you have to get up then I can have access to the washroom and all these things but that person walks up that flight of stairs on a daily basis and doesn't even think about that flight of stairs so it's really important to check those things in your mind before you give information we take all the time to get to that restaurant only to find that flight of stairs right uh okay moving on to the to the fourth question so the question is how can we be an advocate in our workplaces for inclusive language? And I believe for this one, I'm going to be starting off with, with Sam. So, well, Sam, have you, have you had experiences with this? Well, to um, start my answer, I would just like to ask um, 
when you're asking this question, who are you directing it to as we? I'd like to know, do you mean we as Rick Hansen Foundation or we general people in the community, um, employers, workers in general, people with disability themselves? Um, I just in terms That's, of framing my answer, figuring out who we is, is the first challenge. I think, um, I think we as a society, we in the, how can we advocate uh, the individuals with disabilities in our workplaces? So for your individual selves in the workplace, how can you advocate for those things? Okay, great. Well, um, I've heard it said that people with disabilities are not born to live, they are born to advocate. And when I think of that, um, I just think that's absolutely unfortunate and true because we spend so much of our daily energy educating and explaining how our, what our needs are. Um, and unfortunately, we are not necessarily able to spend that energy enjoying our lives. So it's so important for all of us as society at large to learn from each other. And like we mentioned before, asking doesn't hurt. Um, people aren't generally going to be offended if you ask what they need, especially um, employers. Um, people of power in the workplace need to be cognizant of asking people with disabilities how they can be accommodated, what um, they need. And also, it is somewhat um, necess a necessity for a person with disabilities to, when they encounter barriers, to speak up and say how they can be accommodated. And I believe that by working together, we're able to make the world better in that way. I would also like to add that um, uh, disability itself is so often framed in the wrong way. It's seen as what a person can't do. And I would just like to say that we are just functioning in a different way. And that, that's all, it's just a different perspective, a different way of being. Um, no one way of being is better than another. It's just a different way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, th thanks so much. Um, that's really, really important to remember as well. Uh, Megan, over to you. Thanks, Marco. Um, so, so for me and, you know, my workplace or, or workspace, um, you know, in working with CCRW, uh, a national organization that works with both business uh, employers as well as job seekers with disabilities across the country, um, you know, as employees of CCRW or you know myself, it's it's really about um, listening, um, but also having a recognition and a and a really a deep understanding of why we use the words we use or why we say the things we say. Um, recognizing opportunities for learning um, and when you hear you know an opportunity to provide a, a deeper understanding or an opportunity for knowledge exchange or education because perhaps you know you hear someone using um, uh, a term that is not uh, an appropriate one or not from a place of uh, respect and understanding, that there's a safe place for dialogue around that. Um, and I think that the workplace culture plays a really significant role in that, uh, to have dialogue around inclusive language. And, you know, by leading with that, uh, others will have opportunities to, to succeed uh, in a space uh, and, you know, have that context and deeper understanding around language uh, and, and what to say or how to say things and how to interact uh, with individuals, um, you know, in a way that is respectful. Uh, of, of personal choice as well. And so, you know, providing opportunities for knowledge exchange, uh, listening, having, having open dialogue, um, and 
knowing that there has to be a safe place to say things that they're unsure about. And I would say the same thing for, for business. When you're having conversations with business, it might there might be an uncomfortable uh, place that they come to where they don't know what they don't know. So they may some, say something that could be wrong or inappropriate, but you allow for that to happen and you provide education so that they have a deeper understanding around the language uh, that's appropriate. And so just to, to, to lead with education and opportunities for learning and growth. Excellent answer. Setting the tone from the top, I always say, right? Leading by example to reiterate what you said there. Uh, Monica, any final thoughts on this question before we head into the lightning round? I'm going to explain what the lightning round is in a second. Yeah, I'll quickly build on uh, the Megan and Kelly have, uh, have uh, already spoken about a lot of the things that we've talked about. Um, but for me, it's about really being deliberate, not only about the words and the phrases, but the context in which those terms are being used. And one of the places I see it a lot is in workplace accommodations. We use deficit language. So often here, the disabled employee is struggling to keep up with the productivity demands of the job. That's a really ableist perspective, you know, when in fact, it's not the disability that's at the root of the struggle, if that's what you want to call it. It's the accessibility barriers in the workplace that get in the way. And, uh, you know, uh, it may be that the, let's say a person uh, who uses a screen reader might have to take six or 10 extra steps in order to do the same thing. And so I think we really have to be conscious about how we frame these conversations. Um, and, and in those conversations, too often I, I see and hear the words issue, problem, concern in the same sentence as, as disability. And I think we have to just, you know, I don't think it's done maliciously or um, uh, intentionally, but uh, to do harm, but it is doing harm. You know, it, it, it's affecting conversations. And I agree with Megan. It's about having that open conversation, you know, uh, explaining what the impact might be and, and uh, finding other ways of framing it. And then the other part, and I want to build off what, what Sam said right at the very beginning, is there's a lot of different types of language. Um, we generally think about the word, the spoken word, the written word, the signed word, but I think we really need to consider our, our visual language as well. You know, are people with disabilities represented in media, in illustration, um, in um, doing everyday things, in your advertisement? Um, uh, that I think is something that is really important for us to take to heart and to showcase. Yes, I love that we're reaffirming some of these points, um, especially from different people's perspectives and backgrounds. Um, it's, it's a really big deal. Like this conversation around language shouldn't just be about one particular type of language, remembering that we're all impacted in different ways, depending on the language and the methodology at which we're using. But I am happy to say that we are reflective now in a lot of media, news, TV programs. Um, more people with disabilities are being represented. So woot woot uh, for that. Okay, we're going to move on because this is action packed. Um, the lightning round, I'm going to explain how this is going to work. So I'm going to say a term or phrase and I'm going to give each uh, participant an opportunity to say uh, yes to that term, no to that term, maybe, pass, or it depends on the context. Okay, so I'm going to basically say a term, and then I'm just going to go through the list uh, of each of you. Okay, so the first term is that's so lame. Monica, uh, thoughts on that's so lame? No. No. Okay. Uh, let's go to Christine. No. Megan. No. And Wissam. Pass. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Pass. Uh, next term, handicapped parking spot. Handicapped parking spot. Uh, again, Monica. Nope. Christine. Nope. <laughs> Megan. Hard no. <laughs> Hard no. Uh, and Wissam. Pass again. I, I, I personally, I want to speak up on this one. I say no to this term as well. Uh, uh, that's, that's a personal blind spot. Ooh, that's interesting. That's a personal blind spot. Monica. Uh, it depends. Okay. Uh, Christine. No, Megan? but I will add, oh, yeah. hold on. Uh, there's a way to change it. If you want to say that's a personal blank spot. 
uh, oh. removes the disability from the language. Nice. I, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> Megan. Uh, yes to what Christine's statement was. I like it. I like it. And what's up? Ass. Okay. That's totally fine. Um, crippled by anxiety. Ooh. Okay. Monica. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Christine. So much no. So <laughs> much no. <laughs> Megan. Yeah, I'm a no as well. And finally, with some. And I'll pass with uh, an addendum here. I want to make a comment. I've just noticed that I'm passing on, you may have noticed that I'm passing, and I'm passing on purpose because this list of words is, they're English words. And so as uh, we, as the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing community, we're using a different language. Um, so these terms have actually no impact with us in our language. Um, Certainly there are hot button topics uh, within our culture and language, um, but they're not uh, related to, to these list of, of words here. They're different languages. So I think I'm just making a point here in, in passing, but I just want to say that, you know, there, there are words that, like uh, there are words that, that are big no's for me, like uh, hearing impaired, that's a that's mm. a big no, forget it. I don't wanna hear that word. Use the word deaf, uh, hard of hearing, uh, deaf blind, those, mm. those terms are acceptable, thank you. That's great, and I actually think that that's a question that's gonna come in the Q&A Q period for people to address as well about particular language that we can use instead, so we can address that as well. There's one final statement, and then we're gonna move on to closing remarks. You are driving me nuts, Monica. No. Christine. No, but I appreciate that in this, we are discussing um, mental health as well, uh, but no. <laughs> I, I do as well. Uh, Megan. Um, I'll say no as well, but I almost passed on that. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and Wissam. It's, it's a strange uh, turn of phrase for me. Um, uh, I think I'll have to pass again. Okay. And I, I don't know if this matters to everyone for me as the host and a person with a disability, but I would say that one depends on context for me personally. Um, but yeah. Uh, okay. So now we have 60 seconds for each of you to give any closing remarks, any burning things that you thought you didn't get off your chest in this initial official portion of the panel section, and then we're going to move on to uh, the Q&A period. So for the closing remarks, let's start with Megan. Oh, sure. I, I was surprised by that. No. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. <laughs> um, I think for my closing remarks, um, you know, if there was a, uh, a last statement that I want to ensure that I left, uh, you know, the participants of, of this event with is the importance of choice uh, when it comes to language and inclusive language, and that uh, so oftentimes we are um, always asking uh, individuals to identify or, or, or to, to speak to their identity uh, rather than asking them to come as they are. Uh, and I think that we need to do the same uh, with language um, and, and starting, I think, with what Christine said uh, as we started this conversation uh, around the importance of intent uh, when it comes to language. So that's sort of what I would leave uh, leave with and my my final thoughts would be that so choices uh and intent for sure fantastic uh monica any final thoughts you know i th i think that there were there were so many points that uh really built upon each other and uh what i get out of this conversation is i've learned um, uh, and that I can take back from this conversation how I can change how I engage, you know, and how, how I communicate directly. And I think that the more opportunities that we have to have this dialogue, we're just going to, you know, we, we ha have, may have a common goal, but we're all coming at it really differently. And uh, I think that just makes uh, our, our community and our conversations much richer. Okay. Uh, Christine. Thanks, Marco. Um, 
there's so much rattling around in my head that I'd like to say, so it's really hard to do this. But um, first and foremost, I just want to say when it comes to language, um, etiquette, anything around um, disability, the people to listen to are people with disabilities. Um, and so I just want to reiterate that, but also that no one of us can speak for all of us. So uh, I can tell you about my experiences with disability, but somebody who has exactly the same disability as me may identify in different ways, may use different language. So there is no one size fits all for all of us. Disability is an incredibly broad umbrella term. Um, and so make sure that you're engaging with individuals and finding out what their preferences are when talking to them. And when they tell you something about their identity, when they tell you um, how they prefer to be referenced, believe them, don't correct them. Wow, that's powerful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And of course, alas, but absolutely not least with Sam, any final thoughts? Well, I want to just clarify two points. Um, I just want to distinguish between two points. Um, uh, a gesture, gestures and sign language are two different things. So gestures and language, um, you know, languages have grammar, they have structure, they have mm -hmm. rules uh, that's involved with the language. That's uh, my first point. And it's important. Um, it's important to recognize. And for me, I think I use, uh, I advocate for companies to hire and pay for interpreters. Um, and I always have to, to ask, um, and I wonder, do they, do they like, companies are sometimes not willing to pay for interpreters. And I ask, you know, do, do you make people who use wheelchairs pay for wheelchair ramps? It's the same kind of, it's the same concept for accessibility. Providing an interpreter is providing access. Uh, without a ramp, there's no access. And so I'm applying that concept to deaf, deaf blind and hard of hearing, uh, that, that physical access to communication uh, needs to be provided. And without an interpreter, that ramp is missing. So, and who should be paying for the interpreter? Should, should the, the deaf person be paying for the interpreter? Should the wheelchair user be paying for the ramp? And to me, there's no difference. So I think I wanna just put companies and businesses on notice for their employees that, you know, you're providing access and it's not our responsibility to, to provide the access. Um, and I wanna see that access provided everywhere. Thank you for that great point. Um, you know, I know that there are um, other organizations I've seen that are starting to implement video remote interpretation services um, through things like community centers so that you can have access to ASL interpreters in real time at any point on a tablet so that they don't have to be pre-ordered. Um, However, I know this is also something that is impacted from time to time um, due to budgetary constraints, but I think that we're getting there. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the Q&A period because I know that there has been some questions that have come up here. And basically how it's going to work is that the panelists each will have an opportunity to respond if they choose to. So if there is any uh, response that you would like to provide, use the raise hand function on your computer and we'll try to get to as many as we can before we close out the, the uh, session today. So the first question from our audience, let me make sure I got this. Why is the prefix dis? Uh, ability still used, um, and it's not uh, as it's not already setting an unconscious bias. Asked Teresa, is that not already setting an unconscious bias? Does somebody have some thoughts on the term disability? Christine, yeah, go ahead. I have a lot of thoughts. The panelists know this. Um, uh, I'm fine with the term disability, and I really appreciate the term disability because it's accurate. I am not able to walk. There, that is not something that can change. Um, even with accommodation, even with the social model of disability, 
that medical peace will still play in in certain places. The whole world can't change to be accessible. Um, so the thing is, disability is a word I'm fine with because it's not a bad word. People associate disability with being bad. They associate it with being um, a deficit when it's not, it's an identity and it's part of who I am. Um, and I'm very proud to be a person with a disability. So to take away the dis to try to um, hide the disability um, would take away part of my identity and it would, it would eliminate the need for there to be access when there is a need for access. Okay, any other thoughts before we move on to the next question? I know we're, we're getting down to the wire here. Seeing, oops, seeing none. Uh, the next question, this person says, I work for a large organization that shares a great deal of information with the public. What are your thoughts on person first versus disability first in these communications? We wanna be respectful of people's preferences, but we also wanna address at large in the community. And that's from Megan. Uh, anyone else want, and that's not for Megan, that's from Megan. Uh, but is there anyone that wants to answer that question? Otherwise we can move along. Um, I, I can try uh, because I, I think that's, that question uh, is coming from a really uh, good place, uh, but it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, task in terms of, you know, communication uh, for print material. Uh, and I think that, you know, to, to make sort of broad strokes uh, from any perspective, uh, you know, there'll be individuals uh, with lived experience who disagree with the language that you use in a specific document. So, um, you know, take, uh, take the lead, I would suggest, um, you know, other, others may disagree, uh, but from print that we see in, uh, you know, the Accessible Canada Act, uh, and, you know, you, the, the United Nations, the, the CRPD, the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities, and recognize or, or note uh, the sort of that standard uh, you have for language, and, and also note that you, you know that this may not be uh, an individual's preference in terms of person first or uh, disability first language. So um, if you note that, then I think that you come from a place of uh, best practice, but also from understanding um, that's what I would answer. I don't think there's a, a yes or no to that one at all. Okay. Uh, and now someone asked, um, is there an updated list that we should be going off in terms of terms? Uh, as we say, we have about five minutes left. So I do want to give an opportunity for us to have a, a discussion around this. Is there an updated list of terms? And again, any questions that we don't get to everyone in the audience, um, they will be responded to by the Rick Hansen Foundation by email. Uh, does anyone want to tackle that one? Oh, yep, Christine, go ahead. I have like, I personally despise lists of words. Um, uh, and what I'm gonna say is don't focus so much on the words as you do on the tone and listening and being respectful with the individuals you're talking to. Um, when people ask for lists, they're often looking for a list of diagnoses. And not only is that difficult to compile and very long, um, also, a person's diagnosis doesn't really matter in terms of access. What matters is the access. Um, so providing ramps, providing interpretation, providing tactile reading, um, anything along those lines just makes it inclusive for everyone. What matters is the inclusion, um, not the specific diagnosis. Um, and so not a big fan of lists to start with. Um, if you're talking to an individual, respect what that individual has to say about themselves and their disability. Great. Thanks for that answer. We do have a uh, question that just came in directly for Wissam. Um, oh, sorry. Actually, yes, this is Wissam. I would like to add something. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, on this previous point, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, I agree 100% because a list of words doesn't change anything. Attitude will make a difference. Um, you know, a person can say all of the right words and still not have the right approach and the right tone and the right attitude. So just a, a list of terms doesn't make a change. It depends on a person's perspective and how they view the issue. Um, and that will go much farther than just keeping an updated list of acceptable terms. 
I, I fully agree with you, Wissam. Um, um, intention and attitude goes a long way. And in fact, I was just about to throw it to you anyways, so that we could hear your voice on this one. And this is the question we'll end with everyone. Um, so the other ones will be answered later. Wissam, does uh, Canadian Association for the Deaf, I assume, because it's CAD is the person using this, Canadian Association of the Deaf, use the term disability in its communications? They say, my deaf friends identify as minority language users. As a librarian, I highlight books by and about people with disabilities and wonder about including people who are deaf when I do so. And this is by Randy. So maybe final thoughts on that with some. All right, thank you. That's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, again, I would have to distinguish um, two different concepts here. Um, you know, being deaf um, means being unable to hear. Same as uh, was earlier mentioned, being a wheelchair user might be because you are unable to walk. So it's a brief answer, I would say yes. And the interpreter is just having a hard time seeing with some. So we're just going to pause for a quick second here. Looks like we are frozen. OK, we're back online. So in terms of Canadian Association of the Deaf, we prefer to use uh, deaf as the identity. Deaf, deaf, blind, hard of hearing. Um, you know, we do have the perspective that we can't hear, but we can communicate. We can function in the community. We're able to work. We're able to have families. Uh, we're able to have good lives. And it again goes back to where um, your individual perspective is from. If a disability means you're not able to do something, you're not able to learn, you're not able to work, for example, um, our disability is that we are not able to hear. So it's important to distinguish because there is a little bit of overlap sometimes and it feels like we can get really tied up in knots in this issue. But um, yeah, I would just like to distinguish uh, those two sort of regions of deafness. Thanks so much with Sam and thank you so much to everyone involved. I can't believe it. This hour has flown by. I don't know about you panelists, but it has flown by me as the moderator of the conversation. I got some key takeaways here. I was taking notes throughout while moderating. So I'll do my best here to summarize. Um, language is always evolving. Um, you know, so um, there's a general theme that we heard throughout the answer. So it's always evolving and to remember that. Consider disability beyond mobility, right? It's not just about mobility issues, but there's a wide spectrum of disabilities out there. Um, disability can um, sometimes be framed negatively. So based on what someone can't do, but instead, you know, we could, you know, not use ableist language like issue, struggle, disabled thing. So instead focus on a person's abilities, be deliberate, be intentional. Uh, ableist language does drive harm. Access is not the responsibility of the person with disabilities. I, I heard you, Wassam. You know, so let's work together as an organization and as a community to make sure that we're providing these resources and these tools for everyone. And most importantly, I drive this home in every presentation I give, ask how you can best support someone um, if they require supports or otherwise. If you see them struggling, don't just make assumptions. You know, have an opportunity to have a real open and authentic dialogue with these various people. So on behalf of the Rick Hansen Foundation, I want to thank everyone in attendance. I want to thank our panelists, Megan, Christine, Monica, and Wassam for taking your time and energy out of today. And I want to remind you as the attendees that the recording will be sent out at some point later next week via email to all of you who registered. I've been Marco Pasqua. I very much appreciate your time and attention. And any of your questions that we didn't answer will also be answered by email. Thank you so much. I hope you've learned something today. I know I have and have a great afternoon and the rest of your day. Thanks so much.